It is the shared fate of every artwork that it disappears. For some, this can take decades, centuries, even millennia. But eventually, no matter its significance, artistic value, or price, every painting, photo, sculpture, film, video game, novel, or poem will cease to exist. Though some solace can be found in the idea that, for a period of time, whether it be short or long, most artworks can be enjoyed. But some works are less fortunate in their lifespan, doomed to a short existence, and one film in particular seemed to have been relegated to a lifespan one can consider unfairly short considering its quality and impact. Carl Theodor Dreyer's 1928 masterpiece, The Passion of Joan of Arc. This is the story of how it was made, how it was lost, and how it was saved from the dustbins of history. The film's creation began with an invitation Dreyer received to make a film in France after the success of his previous outing, The Master of the House. After considering a few ideas about famous women from French history, such as a film about either Marie Antoinette or Catherine de' Medici, he settled on the story of Joan of Arc, the teenage peasant girl who claimed to have received angelic visions telling her to aid France in its battle against Britain during the Hundred Years' War, who was then captured, tried for heresy, and burned at the stake. A story he was interested in due to the theme of suffering. It is suffering which is the theme in many of my films. Suffering always means ennoblement. Though the part of Joan's life he decided to focus on was not her heroic battles, but the trial which preceded her defeat and capture. And as a source, he utilized the trial transcripts, taking a majority of the film's dialogue word for word from it, though embellishing with the trial's time frame, contracting it into a single day. It was his intent to strip away her mythology and show Joan as he really was, as it says in the film's opening text crawl, not the Joan in the helmet and armor, but simple and human. This differs from most adaptations of her story, such as the concurrently released The Marvelous Life of Joan of Arc, which depicts a far more idealized and heroic version of Joan. The film opens in the middle of the proceedings. Throughout it, we see Joan get subjected to a series of agonizing questions and other maltreatments, as her judges try to make her confess. The reasons for this are multifarious, but chief among them is her perceived heresy, as her claiming to receive visions both goes against the church's authority and contradicts the English king's claim to France, as Joan believed she was commanded by God to drive him and his men from the land. They try various methods, be it trickery by writing a false letter from the French king, or with the threat of torture. It is finally the fear of getting burned at the stake which brings her to confessing. Though her concession is short-lived, as Joan realizes she has betrayed her lord and rescinds her confession. The film ends with her execution by fire, which is followed by an ahistorical riot. To bring this story to life, Dreyer went through painstaking effort to achieve historical accuracy, calling his film a documentary. Besides the aforementioned lifting of the entire dialogue from the trial transcripts, Dreyer also made sure to ground his film through its aesthetics. To begin with, there is not a single actor who can be said to have been prettied up or glamorized, Dreyer forbidding the use of makeup, even the simplest of powders. This is especially effective in the case of Joan's actress, Renee Jean Falconetti, who would not have looked the part of a peasant girl who had been locked up for months with the customary makeup seen in a lot of Hollywood films giving her an appropriate plainness. Dreyer entered some excessive territory as well in his search for accuracy, such as requiring that every actor playing a monk would shave their head, even if they would be wearing a cap the entire film, or having a stand-in get cut for real in this shot. Though that pales in comparison to the costliest of his excesses, that being the construction of an entire concrete castle set, replete with four towers, a moat and drawbridge, chapel, along with a storage and rest area for the crew. This being done in spite of the fact that the usually tight framing allows one to see little of the gigantic set. Though as painful as it must have been to his financier's wallets, Dreyer believed a life-sized and complete set was necessary, as it would have helped the actors immerse themselves better in their roles. The set was also not just troublesome due to its cost, but also because it left little room for the camera and light crew to set up their equipment forcing them to dig holes in the walls and floor to get everything set up correctly. Though despite this strict adherence to realism, the castle set does feel somewhat anachronistic, with many unsymmetrical windows and misshapen rooftops, which may be the personal touch of production designer Hermann Worm, 
who had worked eight years prior on The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, another film with very extreme and misshapen architecture. And like that film, the castle's strange design is perhaps intended to reflect how Joan sees it, her surroundings seeming distorted through her eyes, reflecting her mental state. The cinematography could similarly be said to show her perspective, both literally and emotionally. Dreyer said that the transcript informed the film's style, that he wanted to bring to life the close-quarter combat between Joan and the men judging her. The film's cinematographic style can be said to be disorienting. A majority of the shots are close-ups, especially of Joan's face, and even some of the wider frames show little. Dreyer even goes so far as to avoid the use of establishing shots as much as possible, which captures Joan's feelings of claustrophobia and isolation. The many close-ups of her clerical opponents serve a similar purpose. Their leery, gleeful, and often sadistic faces dominating the frame to intensify their verbal attacks against Joan and expressing the sense of being surrounded on all sides by hostility. Though what really creates the film's sense of disorientation is the editing, which for its time was more fast-paced and rapid than most films. The Passion of Joan of Arc has over 1300 shots, excluding the title cards, which is more than twice the average number for films at the time, and stands in stark contrast to the rest of Dreyer's oeuvre, which consists of films that often had far longer and lingering shots, as Dreyer cut between frames in fast procession, few of them lasting more than 5 seconds, all to further enhance each scene's intensity. Especially the many times Joan is questioned and harangued, and of course when she is threatened with torture, where the fast-paced cutting helps sell the fear and anxiety of the character. It must be noted that even though no torture takes place, and there is not a drop of blood shed, this scene still holds much of its power, helped by the many shots of the spiked wheel, which often seems dangerously close. Though the most important part of the film's imagery, and its most iconic, is the performance of René Sean Falconetti as Joan, one of the main aspects of silent era films that often alienates modern day audiences is the acting, which today seems far too exaggerated, almost cartoonish in how the actors overemphasize every movement, the reason for this being that the more subtle form of acting we know today had not been developed yet. So actors back then were still using the same techniques they employed in the theater, where the more exaggerated movements were necessary to convey a character's actions to an audience that was far away, and one can see a similar problem here. As some of the judges seem cartoonishly evil, Falconetti's performance though feels modern. There is a good reason why so much of the screen time is fixed on her, as Falconetti managed to depict all of June's feelings to perfection and with ideal intensity. Every tear shed, every determined mad glare, every pleading cry feeling as heart-wrenching now as it did back in the film's inception, Falconetti imbuing her character with life and nuance. The process of bringing out this performance was grueling to say the least, though not to the degree that some people have claimed. According to rumors, Falconetti was forced to kneel on stone and then wipe the emotions from her face, a not too uncommon an accusation for Dreyer who had an exaggerated reputation as a tyrant on set. Though later biographers of Dreyer dispelled such stories with quotes from people who were there on set to view their working relationship, that is not to say that Falconetti's ordeal was light, as he had to redo her takes several times, Dreyer often sitting right next to her off screen, whispering directions into her ear, with none of her co-actors around, and as few crew members as possible present only then to repeat that process after viewing the rushes, during which time Dreyer would point out what he liked and disliked, so Falconetti could adjust her performance for the next gauntlet of reshoots. What is also remarkable about Falconetti is that she was not known for her dramatic work, and had only two minor film credits behind her. She was in fact most known for her comedic work on stage, and would not have at first struck anyone as an ideal candidate to depict Joan of Arc. Though when he went to a place he performed in, Dreyer did see something in her which he felt was perfect for the character. According to Falconetti's daughter, Helena, it was because she had the eyes of a suffering woman. And although it is impossible to say if Dreyer caught a glimpse of this, Falconetti had indeed suffered from severe mental problems, which would lead to her demise almost two decades after the film's premiere, when she starved herself to death. Although her life on screen and on earth was short, she has still been immortalized by her unforgettable performance, her pained expression becoming one of the most iconic imagery in cinematic history, and it is hard to imagine a passion of Joan of Arc without her, as according to Dreyer, it was her who created the images, not me. 
As for the film's score, this is where it gets quite complicated. Dreyer never felt that he had found a definitive score for the film. Even the orchestral performance played live at the film's premiere does not hold that title, and since early on its score has been all over the place, the film receiving a different one at its Paris premiere, and was then rescored again in the 1950s for the Ludwig version of the film, which we'll get to, and which Dreyer disapproved of. Due to this, it has become customary for different releases to rescore the film in kind, and besides the three previously mentioned, the film has had 27 different soundtracks, most for live performances, though the scores that are most easily accessible today are Mia Yanashida's piano rendition, Lauren Connors' avant-garde take, Will Gregory's and Adrian Atlee's version, and then Richard Einhorn's orchestral score. Each score has its strong points, but some are far superior to others. The Yanashida version is acceptable and fits the film's mood, though it lacks some of the force which certain scenes require, a single piano not being enough to induce the film's emotions. Lauren Connors' score is interesting, consisting mostly of guitar drones, but it gets old and grating early on in the film, offering the same mood throughout and feeling a bit too modern for such an old film, making the score and film a mismatch. The same can be said of the Gregory and Atle score, though their music is much more varied and befitting of the film's tone, and some of the medieval-inspired tunes do fit more with the story's era, but there is again this mismatch between how old the film is and how modern the soundtrack feels which leaves only Richard Einhorn, whose score I consider to be the ideal version of the film, not only because orchestral music has a timeless quality, relieving it of the mismatching issues of the two previously mentioned scores, but also because its operatic and epic qualities complement the film's emotions better than any other soundtrack. Its chorus is also utilized in an interesting way, acting as a sort of supplement to the lack of spoken dialogue. As an example, the male chorus often represents the judges, their domineering and powerful voices booming in almost every scene, and the pleading female chorus represents Joan's voice. And there are also some neat details, such as the fact that Einhorn recorded the actual bell in the church the real Joan of Arc would have prayed in, and mixed it into the score. It is also important to note that Dreyer was not adverse to showing his film in total silence, and may have preferred it that way. Due to its impact and iconic status, it is hard to imagine that the passion of Joan of Arc was nearly lost to time, due in part to scandal, censorship, and pure bad luck. Its existence was already threatened before it was even finished, as due to her status as a French historical hero who was known for defending against a foreign invader, Joan of Arc was much beloved by French nationalists, who objected to a Protestant Dane like Dreyer directing a film about a French heroine. This includes the screenwriter for the concurrently released The Marvelous Life of Joan of Arc, Jean Jose Frappa, who claimed that Dreyer could not give them a Joan in the French tradition, though Dreyer was of the opposite opinion, saying, As a neutral, I see the whole process more clearly than a Frenchman might have been able to do. I don't believe that Joan's judges were motivated by bloodthirstiness, but from their faith and conviction, and from being blinded by dogma. I actually am convinced that they all have the deepest sympathy for the young maid, and I have tried to show that. Dreyer's troubles would continue after the film's release, when he was forced to delay its French premiere to show it to representatives of the Catholic Church and government censors, who demanded several cuts, such as the wholesale removal of the scene where the judges try to blackmail Joan by withholding the sacrament. And just to add on to his misfortune, the German studio where the film was processed and stored burned down the original negative getting destroyed in the process, leaving a scant few copies swimming around, all of whom disappeared one by one over the years. He was able to resurrect his film in some form by editing a new version utilizing unused takes, but that would burn up as well in a lab fire, leaving audiences unable to view the film for over two decades until in 1951 the film historian Joseph Marie Loduca discovered a copy of the second cut, which he released after giving it some major alterations such as a new Baroque score, replacing some intertitles with subtitles, and what few intertitles he left were changed from the black background to a stained glass window, all in an attempt to modernize the film. Dreyer reviled this re-edit, especially for its music, which he considered ill-fitting due to it coming from a later period than when the film occurs, and because of its loudness, claiming that simple silence would make a bigger impression. And for a long while, the only way to view the passion of Joan of Arc was in its mutilated and altered form, the film having, ironically, received a similar fate to its subject, accused unfairly of blasphemy by overzealous clergymen, 
battered than burned. But unlike Joan, the film would make a return in 1981 when several film canisters bearing its title were discovered in a janitor's closet in the Norwegian Mental Institute, Dikerman Hospital. Some have speculated that a friend of Dreyer's had been the institute's director and that he had borrowed a copy only to never return it, meaning that one of cinema's greatest masterpieces had been saved from oblivion because someone was too lazy to return a film he had borrowed from a friend. A few years later, it was viewed and confirmed to be the original uncensored cut, and was restored and re-released for the whole world to see. And since then, it has enjoyed a safer existence, film conservators making sure to update it to every new format, so future generations can enjoy it. Though as joyous as that is, there are still a plethora of films that were not as lucky. It is estimated that around 90% of silent era films are lost forever, due mainly in part to the flammability of the nitrate film stock they were recorded on, as the two fires that extinguished the passion of Joan of Arc's life twice were just a few amongst many. And some of these lost films are quite significant, including possible classics and masterpieces, such as hundreds of George Méliès films, an early Hitchcock piece, a plethora of F.W. Murnau's films, such as an unofficial adaptation of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and a film that is often considered one of his best, Four Devils, and what few surviving films we have are often not left unscathed, such as Fritz Lang's Metropolis, which is missing a scene, and Eric von Stroheim's overly ambitious near 8 hour epic Greed, which was cut down to little over 2 hours by NGM Studios against the director's wishes, and the closest approximation of his finished film exists in a patchwork form, with few remaining scenes the conservators had being stitched together with still photographs. This should give you enough context to know just how tremendously lucky we are to have the passion of Joan of Arc in its finished state, but also how unlucky it is that numerous films have been lost to flame, degradation, and studio chop jobs. And even though many of our modern formats are far more stable than nitrate film stock, they too will disappear as well. DVDs and Blu-rays degrade. Even digital media is not impervious being susceptible to data rot and relying on the computers and hard drives it is stored on, pieces of tech that will break down as well. So I want there to be three takeaways from this video. One, if you find a bunch of film canisters, for the love of God, keep them cold and away from flame and get them to a film conservator. Two, we should be more thankful to the people and organizations that dedicate untold hours to tracking down lost media to preserve and restore it. Because they are not just bringing back a piece of entertainment, they are also keeping the past alive. And three, try to enjoy your favorite work of art as much as possible, because there is no telling how long it will last. If you have made it to the end of this video, then I want to thank you for watching. And also, if you want to see more videos like this, then feel free to like and subscribe. And also, write down in the comments what lost film you would like to see restored.